So today's webinar is on supporting beneficial insects on farms and in the landscape. I'm Kelsey Virgin, and I'm a project manager with the Pasture Project at the Wall Center, who is hosting this webinar today, along with Danny Heisler from Valley Stewardship Network. So Pasture Project is part of the Resilient Agriculture and Ecosystems Initiative of the Wallace Center at Windrock International. Pasture Project works to advance and integrate regenerative grazing as a scalable market-driven solution for building healthy soil, viable farms, and resilient communities in the upper Midwest, and specifically in a six-state region in the upper Mississippi River Basin, although we do work with some national audiences. Valley Stewardship Network, or VSN, works to protect land and water through research, education, and community involvement in the Kickapoo and neighboring watersheds in Wisconsin. VSN provides educational resources, workshops, and conservation assessments to increase farm BMPs for watershed stewardship. VSN also facilitates the formation and support activities of farmer-led watershed councils. So a little bit about um, our partnership with VSN. So Pasture Project and VSN, along with the Tanner Creek Farmer-Led Watershed Council, have partnered together to form the Tanner Creek Grazing Project. This three-year project provides grazing resources and education to support regenerative grazing in the watershed. The project goal is to work with farmers and landowners in the watershed to directly reduce nutrient and sediment loss through the adoption of regenerative grazing practices. Examples of supported practices include conversion of cropland to pasture, transition from continuous to rotational grazing, and the use of cover crops as forage. And this webinar series is part of our education and outreach efforts. So please visit um, our websites or contact us for more information about our work and to stay up to date on future webinars. We're going to now introduce our speaker today. Um, our presenter is Dr. Claudio Breton, has been on the faculty in the entomology department at University of Wisconsin-Madison since 2003. His research group works on relationships between insects that are considered beneficial to people, such as bees and ladybugs and crops, and how they can be conserved and enhanced in our landscapes. He's been part of the bee and butterfly conservation efforts in the state. Claudio is currently co-lead of the USDA-funded Grassland 2.0, a project that works to support community networks to envision and help move towards future agricultural systems that support people and the environment. So thank you, Claudio, for presenting today. We're lucky to have your expertise, um, and I'm going to hand it off to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Danny and Jane, for the invitation uh, to come today. And as, uh, uh, as Kelsey mentioned, um, I am part of Grassland 2.0. Uh, you should uh, check it out. Um, I'm, uh, when uh, Danny uh, asked me to come and present, she said, um, see if you could link this to grasslands somehow, some of the work uh, that you do. So I'm going to do the best uh, that I can. And as I promised Danny, I've got something about uh, dung beetles in there uh, for you uh, as well. So, uh, so thank you all. Um, and uh, what I want to do today really is uh, cover kind of two really uh, broad uh, topics. One is what are beneficial insects? and why should we care uh, about them? And uh, then the second part is, how can we better conserve them in our agricultural landscapes? I guess if they're beneficial, then maybe we want more of them around, and so what can we actually do to, to maintain them in our ag agricultural landscapes? So um, I'm just gonna jump right into it. I think most of you probably have a general sense of what um, organisms that are beneficial to us uh, might be, especially as they, uh, as they relate to insects. These are things that we sometimes refer to as pollinators, or that are predators or are decomposers. And all of these have a funny title attached to them, you know, a pollinator or a predator or a decomposer. This is a very human-centric perspective. Uh, we come up with those labels because we as people derive benefits uh, from them. And what I wanna talk a little bit about in this first part is who are these organisms? What is it that they're doing? Because really, they don't, they're not born pollinators, they're just born kind of doing their own thing. Uh, they're trying to stay alive, they're trying to reproduce, and in the process of doing what they do, they, um, they do things that we actually find really useful uh, to us. So let me start with the first one that I think is probably the, the one that we most easily uh, can, uh, um, can relate to, and this is uh, pollinators. These are, um, as you can see here, I've got a picture of some beautiful bees, a bumblebee, and, uh, and a little uh, sweat bee over here visiting uh, flowers. But I bet that most people, when they think about uh, bees, which are by far the best pollinators that are out there. I mean, there's other things that do it, birds, there's some lizards, there's bats and so on, but by far the most excellent pollinators out there for plants are bees, insects. But I bet most people think about this, 
you know, think about these little organisms here, honeybees. Um, and I want to just kind of quickly differentiate. Uh, honeybees are indeed bees, but this is one species of bee. Here in North America, it's, uh, it's been introduced. It was introduced probably in the 1600s uh, at some point as the uh, Europeans uh, came to North America. And for the most part, we manage them. You know, they live in boxes. We can uh, reproduce them and expand these colonies as much as we want. And we move them to different parts of the landscape to kind of suit our agricultural needs. So when people talk about save the bees, sometimes this is what people uh, think about. But really what I want you to come away with uh, um, uh, kind of acknowledging today is that there's a lot of other bees out there. These are kind of wild native bees. Uh, here in Wisconsin, where I am, there's over 400 species of these wild bees that are out there. In North America, there's probably over 4,000 species. So compare that to one species of, of honeybee. So there's a lot of different types. And the beauty of these types is that they come in all different sizes and shapes, which they make them uniquely suited to uh, pollinating different kinds of crops, different kinds of flowers. They're, they're active at different times of the year when it's warmer or colder. Um, they nest in different places. And so that diversity gives us a lot of the kind of insurance and capacity to pollinate under a variety of different conditions. Uh, when we put all our eggs into the honeybee basket, mm, that's kind of a risky proposition. So thinking about wild and native bees as alternative pollinators is something that we've been, uh, uh, that we've been thinking about uh, lately. So what is it that, uh, you know, what is this thing that insects do when they, bees do when they pollinate? Well, bees are going uh, for pollen. I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that later. And in the process of doing so, they pick up the pollen on their bodies. And when they visit another flower, some of that pollen falls off. It gets onto the female parts of the flower and you get the successful, uh, if there's enough of that pollen that actually goes, you get successful pollination of, uh, of um, uh, the female structure, which then gets you um, fruits and vegetables and uh, nuts and things like that. Over a third of the crop species that we as people uh, utilize uh, actually are dependent on pollinators of some kind. They're not wind pollinated. Now, most of the, the food items that we use uh, for calories, things like corn and uh, um, uh, rice and uh, wheat and things like that. Those are wind uh, pollinated. But all the things that I actually get excited about when I go to the grocery store, things like uh, fruits and vegetables, the ones that gives us the most uh, minerals and nutrients and things like that come from insect pollinated uh, plants. And, uh, and even uh, wild plants, over 85% of them are actually dependent on, uh, on insect or on pollinators for, uh, for uh, their reproduction. Of the things that, uh, that matter to people, uh, this is a, a study, uh, an economic study that was done uh, by a group where they tried to estimate what is the dollar value at the global scale of insect pollinated uh, plants. And they came up with this number that about $270 billion in today's dollars at the global scale is due to crops that are dependent on insect pollination. And these include what they refer to here as stimulant crops. So if you drink coffee or if you like chocolate or things like that, insect pollinated. If you like to eat uh, almonds or all kinds of other nuts, insect pollinated. Um, if you like uh, fruits, most of them, uh, many of them insect pollinated. And in fact, some of them, if you were to get rid of insects, you would lose anywhere between 20 and 40% of, um, of that value just by having lost those insect pollinators. So very, uh, these are the things that, uh, that fuel a lot of the economies. This is actually about 10% of global uh, uh, agricultural uh, sales, agricultural outputs is based on these insect pollinated crops. Here in Wisconsin, where I am, um, here are the most common um, uh, insect pollinated crops, apples and cherries. Cranberries, Wisconsin is the largest producer of cranberries uh, in the country. Probably that means in the world uh, as well. You couldn't have Thanksgiving in some places in some households if you didn't have cranberries. Most of these uh, are incredibly dependent on insect pollinators. So without insect pollination in Wisconsin, we would lose almost all of this uh, economic uh, activity associated uh, with that. So really important in terms of uh, 
uh, agricultural production, but also in terms of the enjoyment and the kinds of foods that we get to eat uh, because of these insect uh, activities. So that's one type of beneficial insect that I think is kind of easy to, to wrap our minds around. All right, another group of, uh, of insects. All right, Jane, this is your chance. See if we can get the, the poll to go. Okay. As I'm showing here, I'm showing uh, two groups that uh, folks might think of as, um, as predators, uh, lady beetles and these wasps here. And uh, I guess my question to you is, are wasps your friend or your foe? You can talk from personal experience if you want, that's okay. <laughs> oh, look at this, I love you guys. This is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. I, when, I go, when I give a presentation similar to this and I ask people about wasps, they're like, wasps are terrible, wasps sting you, we hate wasps, we should destroy all wasps uh, everywhere all the time. Well, obviously you uh, have already kind of grasped the, the essence of today's uh, presentation, and that is wasps are incredible uh, predators. And uh, they're trying to make a living, and the way they do that is by eating other things, primarily other small insects, those kinds of things that often feed on our crops. They're incredibly important for pest control. Here you see this little uh, multicolored Asian uh, lady beetle here uh, feeding on this little hapless aphid here. Uh, this is a different group of wasps. Wasps, by the way, are an incredibly diverse group, kind of like the bees, incredibly diverse. Um, this is a very specialized parasitic wasp. Doesn't sting in, uh, humans. In fact, these things are so tiny, you probably don't even notice them, but you can see her here depositing an egg inside of an aphid that will then develop uh, a, its own uh, offspring inside of the body of, uh, of the aphid, killing it uh, uh, effectively. So there are a lot of insects that make a living, not by feeding on pollen, but by feeding on other insects. And if it wasn't for them, we would probably be ankle deep in aphids and caterpillars, and our plants would be uh, defoliated. In fact, it doesn't take much to actually see what happens when plants uh, are moved to another country or another uh, continent without their normal, um, uh, I'm sorry, when herbivores are moved to another uh, country like the emerald ash borer, for example, where they're not under control of their normal predators and parasites. We see mass mortality of those, uh, of those food resources that, um, you know, that, they're that these uh, beetles are, are feeding on. So it's only once these uh, natural control agents can suppress their populations that we can uh, avoid some of that damage and not see some of that damage. Some of the work that uh, that our own uh, that my own group did, uh, looking at potatoes and uh, its primary uh, pests, which are these um, sadly very beautiful beetles here. This is the Colorado potato beetle. The eggs of the Colorado potato beetle um, are shown here. They're devastating for potato crops uh, throughout uh, anywhere they're really grown, um, and they're fed upon by a range of beetles, including this beautiful uh, ground beetle here. And what we found is that. Egg predation of uh, uh, the Colorado potato beetle eggs is anywhere between 20 and 30 percent due to the predation of these ground beetles. But this predation is only present when, um, when the surrounding areas around a farm had enough of these field margins relative to the size of the farm to actually harbor enough of these uh, ground beetles. When the fields got really big, and in proportion, these little marginal areas that are not cropped became relatively small, we actually saw very little predation of these. So this is a bit of a foreshadowing for something that, that'll come later on, which is how do we actually conserve and maintain and derive those benefits that we want out of these, uh, out of these little organisms uh, that are out there. And what, uh, what I'm gonna uh, follow on to say is that you need some habitats out there for these organisms to live in to then colonize and get into your fields in order to do their job. And when there isn't enough, because our fields have gotten bigger um, and less uh, diverse and our landscapes have gotten less diverse, it's harder to actually maintain these beneficial insects out there. In fact, what we did is we, we uh, did a study where we looked at how simplified our landscapes are. And we defined simplification by uh, looking at how much cropland is in an area and how much of that cropland is just a couple of crops that are kind of large fields, uh, fence row to fence row. And the more of those you had in the landscape, we found that it was more, these are areas 
where people tended, where farmers tended to apply more insecticides uh, to their crops. And what we uh, linked that to was the decline of the capacity of things like these predatory lady beetles to actually act and suppress those pests. When those landscapes don't have the capacity to support those uh, beneficial insects, we take matters into our own hands and we use insecticides to actually control those, uh, those pest uh, insects. So this, there's a cost to us uh, in not having these organisms doing their job uh, out there. And uh, I can give you more details on this, but this I should also add is after you've accounted for all kinds of things like you know, where in the upper Midwest uh, growers are growing, what crops are being grown there, how valuable is the crop and so on. So even after you adjust for all of those, just having less diversity in the landscape means you're more likely to have to use uh, insecticides. So again, uh, pollinators, uh, predators, and now, uh, Danny, as I promised, decomposers. You know, uh, this is actually one of the groups that our group doesn't, uh, doesn't actually uh, work on, but they're a wonderful and incredibly diverse uh, group. Here you can see this little uh, dung beetle here uh, scurrying around the top of a dung pat, uh, those holes uh, that, you, uh, that you can kind of see here. Um, are actually uh, where the adults and the larvae are actually uh, feeding in. And this is an example of one person's uh, garbage is another person's treasure or another organism's uh, treasure. What looks like a waste product is actually full of resources for these little consumers. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of nutrients locked up inside of these uh, dung pats that even though you and I can't make use of that, in fact, we try to stay away from it as much as possible, there are a whole group of insects, including uh, dung beetles, that actually make their entire life, they're entirely dependent on the energy and the resources uh, inside of these. Some of these uh, dung beetles, what, what dung beetles will do is they'll lay an egg or a series, uh, actually, what they'll do is they'll colonize it, they'll rip off a piece of this, uh, of this um, material, and they'll drag it either underground or they'll roll it off uh, away from, uh, from the dung pile here, um, and they will lay their eggs on it, and their offspring, their little larvae, will actually feed on, the, uh, on these little carved off um, um, dung balls like this. Um, so these are either the tunnelers that'll dig into the dung pat, bury the, um, the, uh, the dung underground, the ones that walk away from the dung pat and do the same thing. And there's a, there's a group of them that actually reside entirely uh, within this. Uh, you know, they might make a few little chambers just underneath, uh, underneath this. There's actually a really great uh, video that uh, the Pasture Project uh, put together. Uh, I've got linked here that um, shows you uh, some videos and some close-ups uh, of this. Now, the dung beetles in some parts of the world are incredibly efficient at uh, breaking up uh, dung pats, including those of elephants and those of all kinds of uh, other large uh, mammals, and making them disappear sometimes within 48 hours. You know, incredibly efficient at, at moving these, uh, these materials away and, uh, and burying them. Um, in more temperate areas, like where we are right now, usually uh, by the end of a growing season, the dung pats are mostly gone. Usually within two or three months, um, you know, you can see most of the, um, of the material having been uh, kind of broken down and decomposed. I strongly encourage you, if you haven't done this already, uh, to go to a, what looks like a dried off dung pat, you know, and lift it over. Uh, and see what's what's going on inside. There's just a tremendous amount of life, and it's just uh, uh, it's just amazing. Now, one of the things that uh, that happens uh, when this uh, dung is being redistributed into the soil is not only does it lose mass over time. This is the number of days here, and this is the amount of uh, material that started in this one experiment that this Japanese group of re uh, researchers did, but you also find that the amount of nutrients like nitrogen and potassium and phosphorus that's locked up in, that, in the dung itself starts to disappear and it starts to move into the soil, into those burrows that are made into the soil. When you've got dung beetles around, you tend to get a lot more of that redistribution of material faster, about 30% faster or even faster uh, in the first month when there's beetles around. If there's no beetles around, some of that will happen just on its own through rain and through leaching but those insects are really important in moving it down into the, into the soil. And as you get more and more loss of the dung, 
the soil nitrogen content goes up and plant growth also tends to increase. There's more, more nutrients available for the, for the roots of the plants and the plants tend to respond uh, in turn. So there's a, there's a positive uh, um, feedback there that could actually uh, be happening. Now, one of the things that happens inside of those dung balls is that there's all kinds of other organisms that are also trying to make a living uh, within them. Not the least of which are flies of different kinds, including face flies and horn flies, which can cause pink eye uh, for, uh, uh, for cattle. Well, as these dung beetles are rummaging around and feeding on all the dung in there, they will uh, compete with those flies. They'll get rid of that material that the flies need. And actually, once in a while, they might actually eat some of those flies in the, in the process of doing so. Um, they are, by making the dung disappear, they're decreasing the, the possibility that some parasites that might occur in the dung make it back into the, um, into the cattle. Um, the cattle are more likely to feed on the grasses when the dung is uh, disappearing. And uh, this is free nutrients that people don't have to pay for, you know, so you can actually put a dollar value uh, on that. So this one kind of back of the envelope study in the UK basically said, Due to the action, let's imagine a situation where you've got beetles versus when you don't have beetles. Just due to the action of these uh, insects, you have an economic gain that you don't have to, um, that, you're, that you're benefiting f uh, by having those organisms doing their job. Uh, and they estimated that it was as much as $54 per animal, uh, per, per uh, cattle uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, per year that is gained by having these little organisms make these dung, uh, dung balls, uh, making the, the dung disappear. Uh, here in the upper Midwest, here in Wisconsin, there were, there's uh, at least eight different species of dung beetles. Some of these are beautiful. They've got horns on them. They fight the males and the females fight. They're not as colorful or as large as some of the African ones that, that you'll see. These here are dwellers. They kind of live within that dung pat throughout their entire lives. These here actually roll balls uh, away, and I actually don't know exactly what, uh, what these two uh, species uh, do. I might have to think of a research project on dung beetles. I just think they're so cool. So, okay, so we've got these uh, groups of organisms. They're all trying to make a living. In the process of doing so, we derive some benefits uh, from them, agricultural, economic, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and there's others too that I haven't even touched on that are, might be a little harder to, to evaluate. So what can we do to actually conserve them in our agricultural landscapes? What practices can we actually uh, adopt that might make their lives a little bit better? Um, and I wish I could cover this really broad field uh, right now, but I'm gonna talk kind of in general principles because the organisms are really different. Each one of them needs a little bit something uh, different, but the, the general idea that I think applies to a lot of, uh, a lot of these uh, groups, I think can be summarized in these three general areas. One is we need to provide food for them. The second is they need to have some shelter and the environment that they live in needs to not be toxic uh, to them or can't be so disturbed all the time that their populations are constantly getting knocked back. And if you really think about it, this is the same kind of stuff that we need. Too. We need food, we need a house, and we need to, not to get poisoned or disturbed or, you know, uh, you know having something knock us back uh, constantly. So from the perspective of uh, bees, bees feed on pollen. Pollen is their protein source. They like nectar too. I mean, that's actually what honeybees are collecting to make, their, uh, to make honey that then we take and we can sell that. That's another uh, benefit. That comes from the nectar of the plants. But for the most part, what they really need is the protein, which is kind of like their steak. You know, it's like you gotta have some meat to actually uh, grow, your, grow your young. And in order for that to happen most effectively, you need a diversity of different flower types out there. Each flower, each flower pollen has a slightly different nutrient composition. And so that diversity actually is beneficial to their growth, to their ability to have strong immune responses and a variety of other things. You know, this is like, you know, as much as I like going to McDonald's once in a while, you know, it's good to eat something a little bit different. And uh, we've all seen the movie of what happens if you just go to McDonald's uh, all the time. It's not a pretty, uh, it's not a pretty picture. So, um, we did a study where we actually looked at some uh, practices that are used in agricultural areas that are sometimes referred to as pollinator strips or pollinator enhancements or pollinator plots. 
and um, and kind of accumulated the literature from uh, from all over the world. And what we found is that almost invariably, when you look at the abundance and the diversity of the different types of pollinators that are there, you almost always have a positive effect on their abundances. When you have habitats adjacent to crop fields that have some diversity of flowers uh, in them. And again, this is where their food uh, items are. Bees come in and you can actually maintain them uh, in some way. And what's important uh, for bees uh, is that there's food at different times of the year. Early spring uh, flowers, things are happening in the middle of the season, as well as some of the late uh, late planting, uh, late uh, blooming uh, flowers. Uh, ideally, these would be kind of native plants that are co-evolved with these, uh, with this diversity of, of native uh, species that are out there. And um, uh, yeah, and that provide that, that range of resources that are out there. Again, this is like, you know, imagine that you go to McDonald's, but a McDonald's is only open on Sundays or something like that. I'd starve the rest of the week if that's all that, that, that I ate. So it's good to have something available to you uh, year round. The same is true with those predators. Those predators are actually uh, not only feeding on crop pests. Crop pests might be around for a very narrow window of time, but they're actually, most, uh, a lot of the time, they're actually feeding on other pests or other organisms in the, um, in the landscape. And so maintaining a diversity of habitats that has some of those uh, uh, other food sources like other aphids or other caterpillars that are out there allows them to maintain their populations so that when you get something in an agricultural field, you can very quickly uh, kind of uh, uh, get a response by these predators uh, that are out there. And even the predators, even though they're predator, they also need a little bit of sugar to fly around. This is a, uh, uh, that's kind of like where their rocket fuel is, is those uh, super sugary drinks uh, that they get. There's a lot of really great uh, literature out there. A great starting place is at uh, the website of the, uh, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. They have a lot of resources there. Pollinator Partnership is another uh, site. They've got guides on the kinds of plants that uh, pollinators are attracted to in various parts of the country and uh, what you can do to start uh, augmenting some of this in um, both uh, in, farm, in farm areas. Shelter. What most of us uh, probably don't uh, know is that most bees, those wonderful pollinators, are actually not, they don't live in boxes and they don't live communally. A lot of them are solitary and most of them, 70% of them actually live in the ground. So maintaining where they will uh, dig, dig holes like this and provision their offspring, these little white maggots here, with their pollen balls that they've been collecting very, uh, very, very carefully and the entire life cycle of this, uh, of this bee, actually not the entire, but the larval stages of this uh, bee occurs underground where they then pupate and eventually emerge. So having places in the landscape where they can nest and not have the soil disturbed is actually a really important uh, feature of the habitat uh, that, uh, that allows them to maintain themselves. In fact, habitat loss is believed to be one of the main factors responsible for wild bee declines throughout the world. And this is a global pattern that we're, that we're actually uh, seeing. In some parts of the world, um, uh, there have been uh, efforts like this to actually create some little refugia within uh, agricultural areas, such as these uh, beetle banks, as they're called. These are perennial strips of grass that are slightly uh, kind of higher than uh, the intervening areas. And the intervening areas is where the crops are actually grown, like this green here in the background. And these areas here are not used for production. They're only, you know, maybe five or six feet uh, wide. And yet, they are, are, they're great habitats for these ground predators, spiders, beetles, and so on. They build up in the winter and in the spring. And then when the crops start to come up and they're colonized by aphids, these, lady, these uh, beetles, these ground beetles will come out of these uh, little refugia, these banks, you're, you're kind of banking them uh, and growing, growing your, uh, your capital there and uh, kind of having it move out into the, uh, into the adjacent uh, farmland like this. One of the things that, habit, that, uh, that this kind of ties into is the idea that perenniality or places that we don't disturb continuously has a benefit for the conservation of, uh, of beneficial uh, insects. Annual cropland that we till or we replant or we cut down um, only provides uh, food and resources for a very short period of time for these beneficial insects. 
On the other hand, uh, you know, there are other farming systems, including those that take advantage of perennial uh, grasslands, pastures, uh, and so on, that can provide production, uh, provide agricultural opportunities, and yet have that diversity and perenniality that we're learning is actually so important for the maintenance of, uh, of these uh, organisms. Here you can actually see a close-up of uh, this uh, beautiful uh, dairy uh, heifer here. Actually, it might be a, a dairy cow. Um, that is feeding in this uh, uh, grassland, and you can actually see some of the um, some of the flowers. Here's some clovers here. Here's some red clover uh, right over here. Um, some pastures that we've wor we've worked in actually, uh, you know, will have other kinds of flowering plants as well that get visited by butterflies, by uh, by bees, um, and and so on. And uh, and if you rotationally uh, manage your your grazing. Then there are times during the production cycle, actually, where some of these areas have a chance to rebound and flowers can, come, can actually come back. So the rotational pattern itself, we believe, is an opportunity for the recovery of those flowering plants that then become uh, really good food for, uh, uh, for insects. Some of so the last topic day, that I want to talk about uh, real quick. Whoop, sounds like somebody's got uh, their uh, mute uh, off. Uh, thanks. Um, the last one I, I want to talk about is uh, the idea of kind of creating environments that are not so uh, toxic uh, to insects. One of the most commonly used uh, class of, uh, um, of insecticides, of, um, of pesticides in agricultural systems uh, are this group of insecticides here, the neonicotinoids right now. Their use have, has actually just skyrocketed in, uh, in North America in the last 20 years uh, or so. These are, uh, th here's some of the, the names uh, of the commonly used ones, thymethoxam, imidacloprid, clothianidin, very frequently used as uh, coatings on seeds. It's actually really hard to find uh, corn, for example, these days that doesn't have uh, some neonicotinoids uh, associated with them. And we've, lear we've learned that direct contact of these insecticides here, which sometimes happen as they're planted and they kind of come off of the, the planters like this, Direct contact uh, with of those insecticides with insects, guess what? Kills them. They're insecticides. That's what they're supposed to do. And bees in particular are very sensitive to, um, to neonicotinoids from direct uh, exposure. Even at very low doses, though, when it doesn't outright kill them, it does affect their behavior, their ability to orient, their ability to learn and relocate flowers. So there's all these kind of long-term chronic effects that also uh, depress their, their uh, populations. And I guess if there's one thing that I'd like to kind of um, uh, get out there here is that we've really abandoned one of the cornerstones of management of agricultural management in the last 30 years by using these kinds of insecticides in a prophylactic way. And the cornerstone is the use of integrated pest management, uh, IPM. And this amazing study here by my colleagues at, uh, at Purdue uh, kind of summarizes right here what the, you know, what we've lost by, by not using integrated pest management. And what they found in these uh, field scale uh, studies is that by using IPM, you can reduce insecticide applications by 95% and at the same time not affect your yield of your crops. And actually, you can increase the yield of those crops that are dependent on pollinators. So it's true that things like the striped uh, cucumber uh, beetle here, which uh, feeds on both uh, uh, melons and on corn, um, is higher when you use IPM compared to conventional uh, management that uses insecticides. But here's the threshold of damage, you know, that is needed to actually see any loss of crop. Very few times in the using, even when you use IPM, and IPM doesn't say don't use insecticides, it just says get out there, scout, and only apply them when you need them. And when you do that, it's actually very rare that these populations even get above that threshold that causes any damage. So yeah, you can depress populations, but the reality is they never get to the point where they're damaging. And so they found that there was really no difference in uh, corn yield, you know, when they used conventional management with the, a lot of insecticides compared to the, uh, the IPM approach. And in fact, if I squeeze my eyes a little bit, it looks like these blue dots, which is the IPM approach, always look a little bit higher than the uh, conventional management uh, right there. You know, this was a four-year study, a field scale. These are 10-acre uh, fields, so maybe not 100-acre fields, but it was, 
very impressive uh, study. And on the other hand, what they found in watermelons was that there was a significant increase, a statistically significant increase in uh, watermelon yield, uh, primarily due to the fact that you ha they had more pollinators uh, in these. And then the final one is that we also poison the resources, not just of the flowers by using neonics, not just the insects themselves by spraying insecticides on them, but I didn't know this, but uh, the, um, the compounds that are used as uh, anti-worming agents for cattle, the anti-helminthics, things like ivermectin and so on, so, uh, these compounds are actually excreted in the feces and they are actually toxic to the dung beetles that are living, trying to live inside of the, the feces. And uh, it's, a, the, it's a dramatic decline, 80% decline, an effect that even occurs uh, as long as three months after uh, the treatment. And these were actually some studies that were done here uh, in Wisconsin. And uh, when you've got fewer beetles uh, or no beetles at all, there's a decline in those dung pat decomposition and all of those benefits that we uh, normally would get um, are not, um, we, we don't have a chance to actually uh, um, see those actually uh, happening. So again, how do we conserve them? Think about what foods do they need? How can we create shelter or places where they don't get disturbed uh, all the time? And how do we kind of uh, reduce their mortality through our use of agrochemicals uh, out there? And I hope I've less, left some time for questions. It's a huge field. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation and for, uh, for your time. Well, thank you so much, Claudio. This was extremely interesting. You had my, uh, you've captivated my attention and like have so much, you've taught me a lot about insects and made it a lot more appealing. I was actually like trying to write down facts and take pictures <laughs> of your slides as quick as I could and snap it out to a whole lot of folks. And like, All right. and they're like, oh, I didn't know this. And so uh, you were, uh, your reach was going out a lot farther than this, uh, this Zoom. So as and in real time. Good. So, Thank you for spreading the good word. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, it's definitely a good word. So um, if we have some questions, I don't know if we've got anything in the chat box here, but um, if anybody has any questions, we'll certainly take them now. Um, otherwise, I know I had a few things that kind of came to my mind. Um, you talked a little bit about kind of creating habitat. So, you, so uh, our pollinators live in the soil. So bees live in generally what, 70 or 80%? Is that yep, right? Yep, 70% are ground nesting, yeah. Okay, so between those and then also beetles. So is there, you know, my, my analytical sense kind of starts to come to mind and I'm thinking how, is there kind of a rule of thumb in terms of like a refuge um, mm -hmm. to tillable or, or what, tell us like, what, what should we do? Very good question. Yeah. How much is enough? Like what's the minimum, you know, that right. we need to get out there? I guess I'll start with this. Something is better than nothing, you know, um, although there is some concern with some um, in around some circles that maybe if you create a, an environment that's too small, that actually what you're doing is you're drawing them in and then they're surrounded by, uh, you know, maybe insecticides or maybe, you know, places where they can't even find food. And we refer to those as ecological traps. They look really good, but once they get there, they're kind of stuck and they're, they're actually not, uh, not good. So, um, so obviously bigger is better, but you know, you have to do that in a judicious way. There are some, um, uh, recommendations and, uh, there's a little bit of data on this, but there's some recommendations that say it'd be great if you could get up to like the 10 to 20 percent range, you know, something like that. And uh, you can array them in various different ways. Maybe they could be along fence rows, you know, they could be uh, bigger patches. Maybe they become part of a rotation. Maybe you can have some annual, um, you know, things that, that are uh, flowering plants that, that are in there. I think there's different ways of doing that. But, you know, I, that's, that's one number uh, that I've seen. Usually the bigger, the better, because there's more food there. You can build the population up. And then the more that's there, the more they're able to get out into the landscape, you know, and do what they uh, do what they do. This actually, Danny, brings up a really interesting and a bit of a, a dilemma. You know, there's a lot of people out there, maybe even, uh, you know, folks that are, uh, you know, that have animals. They're thinking, yeah, but, you know, my, my grass doesn't need pollination, you know, so why am I, you know, why is this interesting? Well, uh, 
you know, it, it is interesting. You know, first of all, it creates this resource that is a benefit to the entire community, you know, through judicious management of land, even if you're not dependent on those pollinators, maybe you will be at some point, you know, maybe there's, you know, maybe you have an orchard uh, on your system or maybe you have a vegetable production system. Maybe they could be of value, but it's actually something that everybody benefits from. And so this is one of those tricky things. How do you kind of get everybody on board to do this and to help out? What kind of, you know, what kind of uh, partnering could we do with neighbors and things like that to get this to happen, even in places that aren't needing pollinators uh, out there? So yeah, it's a tricky question. Right, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So are there any um, habitats that are, or areas in certain parts of the, the landscape that are more or less beneficial, like maybe along wooded lines, like field buffers that, mm -hmm. that, are, that maybe aren't, are more, they're less productive crop ground. Um, yeah. Would they be okay uh, areas of refuge? Absolutely. Those, those are, in fact, things right along that junction between woodlands and, uh, and the cropland, you know, you can't really get a tractor and machinery in there really well. Uh, we worked with folks in Virginia, actually, on a project looking at switchgrass and uh, the use of switchgrass. And they, they don't like to get their equipment too close to the edge because there's limbs that fall down and it's actually kind of, it's, there's a risk to their, um, to their equipment uh, to get into these areas. So they wanted to create these 30, 40, 50 foot buffers, you know, outside of the drop zone. Uh, and those are perfect areas. And as it turns out, Woodlands themselves, particularly in the spring, are one of the few places that actually flower early enough to actually have resource in them for bees. Trees are flowering early, you know, sometimes a lot sooner than you get things in, in prairies. Um, there's uh, there's uh, ephemerals, kind of uh, wildflowers in the understory of, uh, of woodlands. You know, if we can keep the, the buckthorn out and the Japanese honeysuckle out, uh, you know, there's actually resources there for bees. So even maintaining a little bit of uh, woodlots is actually a really good, um, you know, good habitat uh, for bees. Uh, some bumblebees will actually nest in the, uh, in the forest themselves and then come out and, uh, you know, go elsewhere like that. So yeah, so marginal habitats, areas that are too steep, areas that are not very productive, great places to grow grasses and to grow forbs, to grow flowering plants that are, that are good for bee food. Awesome. Yeah. I've asked a lot of the questions. Other folks that have questions, feel free to unmute and jump in. There's also a question in the chat. Thank, thanks, Kelsey. All right, um, I've loved learning more about dung beetles since it can take up to a season for dung beetles here in Wisconsin to recycle manure. Are there other measurable benefits? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so the, the recycling, so there's various components, various ways in which the action of those dung beetles can actually uh, play out. Some are more in the short term and some are more in the long term. The, the long term ones um, might be things like improving organic matter in the soil. Just by bringing down the dung and that uh, undigested material into the soil is kind of like incorporating, you know, uh, you know it's like mulching. It's like incorporating your own uh, organic matter into the soil. So that's something that's gonna build up very slowly uh, over time. You also aerate the soil. So that's kind of a longer term thing, kind of like earthworms. You could think of the effect of the, those, that tunneling behavior as creating that openness uh, like that. So that's on the long-term side. The medium-term side is the liberation of that nitrogen and that can happen pretty quickly. Um, you know, within, I mean, nitrogen moves around with water uh, a lot. So I'd say even within the same season, you're probably gonna get a lot of that nitrogen starting to stimulate production of the grass itself. And then even on the shorter term, as that dung pad is fresh and it's gonna get colonized by dung beetles, by flies, by other things, that potential reduction in the competitors, in those things that can uh, bother like those flies, that can even happen within the same season uh, as well. So uh, even on the short term. So yeah, I, think it's, uh, I think they have benefits that, that span the entire range. What's really interesting, I, I, I'll just give a little anecdote uh, here. Um, when cattle were moved to Australia, there were no large uh, ungulates uh, like that in Australia. So uh, that they, and so they, they brought them there to forage in the outback, um, you know, for the, for the beef industry. The native dung beetles 
we're used to processing the the feces, the dung of uh, the the native mammals, which are things like kangaroos and wallabies and small little organisms that actually conserved as much moisture as possible because it's really dry in Australia. And so they form these little pellets, kind of think, think like rabbit pellets. And so the dung beetles that were native to Australia couldn't process the dung from the cattle, which is this juicy, wet uh, sort of a thing. And in a very short period of time, there was a huge outbreak of, uh, of uh, face flies, uh, horn flies, that um, when you go out to the outback and you actually uh, watch people talk, you can watch videos of people talking, they're always talking like this, they call it the outback wave, and they're actually swatting flies away from their face because the fly problem is so big uh, there. And they actually went to Africa and gathered up uh, um, dung beetles from Africa and did a series of releases in the 50s and 60s to establish a dung beetle population or dung beetle community that was capable of dealing with, uh, with that problem. And in a lot of places, the fly problem has actually gone away. So, um, so this is like um, a reintroduction of uh, dung to, uh, to its uh, you know, consumers uh, right there. So yeah, so I think some of these effects can actually happen on a pretty short term, uh, pretty short basis. There's another question in the chat box. Um, what would be the most valuable cover crop for beneficial insects? Yeah, really great question. So this is something we're actually looking at uh, in my group uh, right now. Uh, so if you use things like uh, winter wheat and other things, um, winter wheat, um, if you're using it for forage, that doesn't really matter uh, what, what happens to it because you're going you're gonna to cut it down. But early in the spring, uh, grains, small grains, tend to get colonized. Some of them uh, will get colonized by aphids. Well, those aphids, uh, grain aphids, there's a, there's a whole series of, uh, of grain aphids. Um, those aphids are actually great food for those early season lady beetles that are coming out of uh, hibernation and are looking for something uh, to eat. And so what we found is you can actually get a buildup of lady beetles in some of those, um, those early planted uh, crops, actually the fall planted uh, you know, cover crops. Um, and then if the timing is right, and this is where things get a little bit tricky here in the upper Midwest, uh, if the timing is right and uh, those aphids uh, and those lady beetles are around as you get your other crops like soybeans coming up, then there's the possibility of having those lady beetles find an easy food source in the soybeans, soybean aphid primarily, as that's starting to mature. But the timing has to be just right. Uh, nevertheless, you've built up a little bit of that, of that lady beetle population, which is a good thing. Um, winter wheat, though, doesn't produce any flowers. And so in terms of supporting uh, bees with cover crops, then you want to start looking at things that are actually flowering. And so there are things like uh, camelina and um, even um, uh, uh, oil seed, uh, oil seed rape like canola, things like that, that you can get an early season crop. And those are actually very attractive to, um, uh, to early season um, bees and, and flies, actually. So there's some flies that are really good pollinators uh, as well. So I would start thinking about flowering cover crops in addition to just, uh, you know, things like buckwheat and, and other things rather than just, you know, your traditional uh, rye and winter wheat and things like that if you want to start supporting, um, you know, bees as well. Thanks, Claudio. I think a lot of times we think about beneficial insects in terms of pollinators and think, you know, along the lines of how do we incorporate different flowering, you know, cover covers and which can sometimes be a challenge, how it works into our crop rotations. And then of course, seasonally, right. But, um, you know, when you started talking about aphids, I'm like, yeah, the beneficial insects and, and the beetles. So that really, um, that brought a really different perspective and, and especially thinking about uh, different types of benefits, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's a really cool perspective. Yeah. Um, and then back to the chat box, more questions, because this is, this is a really great presentation and very interesting stuff. So, um, and more on the dung beetles. Um, do the dung beetles, um, require smaller pasture sizes or margins around the fields like some some of the predators or since they live in dung is any pasture size a good habitat for them yeah that's a really good question i am i'm gonna have to answer this one a little bit diagonally um uh, dung beetles many dung beetles are actually really good flyers and so they'll they'll smell it and they'll fly in you know uh 
You could do this experiment on your own if you're in the desert southwest uh, at some point. They will colonize fresh dung very quickly, you know, uh, from, from a very uh, long distance. Um, on the other hand, you tend to see in experiments they've done in the tropics, for example, you tend to see that actually dung beetles tend to be aggregated near edges uh, sometimes. So having really large fields, you might think uh, maybe that's a little bit harder for them uh, to get to. But I don't want to generalize too much because maybe that's a specific to tropical beetles or, uh, or something like that. But I think for the most part, they're pretty, they're pretty mobile. Um, let me make sure I, I got that right. Yeah, smaller pasture sizes. I don't know. I think that's a really good question. I think it'd be open for uh, for a little bit of uh, investigation. Yeah, but I could see that being an issue. But you know, but they're also really good flyers. So it sounds like a real opportunity for the Graton Lab to take on some I, uh, dung beetle research. Some intrepid undergraduate <laughs> is gonna. You know, I, I think it's fascinating, but when you read the methods sections of those studies, they're like, we shoveled out, a, you know, two pounds of, uh, you know, cow dung and mixed it in a container and then put it in a tray. I'm like, somebody else gonna, is going to have to do that right now. <laughs> it's going to take some very special grad students for that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. So more in the chat, we've got in regards to ne neonicotinoid use, is non-target or interaction a symptom of over-application or is it an inherent use with neonics themselves? No, I, I think, well, there's two different, uh, two different ways to, dis to, I think, characterize over-application. One part of over-application is just using it above the labeled rates, you know, more than you're supposed to. I'm gonna to have to assume that the, that uh, producers are using them at the labeled rates. What's happening is we're getting more and more of the landscape actually getting uh, getting that applied to it. So um, I don't know if you would call it over application. It's just a very extensive application, you know, to a very large uh, large area. That is definitely uh, uh, an issue. I think they do have some uh, some unique characteristics. They're neurotoxins. A lot of insecticides are neurotoxins, but these are neurotoxins. Um, they are also very water soluble, and so they, the reason why they will, you will coat them on the seeds is because as the plant starts to grow, it'll suck it up, and it actually the, the compounds themselves become um, systemic into the uh, vascular tissues of the plant. And so they'll become expressed in the nectar, in the fluids that the plant puts out, in the pollen, in a variety of different uh, uh, organs of the plant. And so... Um, if you're trying to target an herbivore that's feeding on a leaf, that's awesome. Every time it takes a bite of the leaf, it's going to get some of that. But you're also potentially putting at risk some of those organisms like pollinators that are going to be feeding on the, uh, on the nectar uh, as well. So that's something that's going to have to be, um, you know, that you would have to, I think is inherent in, in the neonics. Uh, the other thing, because they're so water soluble, they actually will get into the soil and get into our water. So there's uh, groups in, in various parts of the, uh, the country, including here at UW, that are actually looking at what happens when these neonicotinoids end up in the water supplies and in the wells and in the, in, do they affect aquatic insects, uh, for example. Um, you know, we, we don't know. The, the levels are pretty low, but they're out there and they're moving around. The, the fate of those neonics is not like once you apply it, it's done and it just disappears. It actually moves around in the environment, and we're still trying to figure out exactly where it goes and is it is it lethal, uh, or can it have uh, impacts on on other organisms? So I think neonics are. Um, I mean, there there are some countries that because of these uh, understood risks have just decided to take what's referred to as the precautionary principle and just say we're just going to ban their use. There's too many risks. We might not understand them all, but until we understand them, we're not going to allow them uh, to be used. Um, here in, in our country, uh, the EPA has a different philosophy, which is if you've demonstrated no effect, then that's good enough, you know, and, uh, you know, obviously you haven't had the opportunity to check all the effects. So, uh, so that's where the, the, the trouble is. Um, there's a question here about sharing slides. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, you'll also, I think, be able to see them in the presentation that, mm -hmm. uh, that is going to get posted. Uh, yep. But I'll, I'll give Danny, in fact, uh, I think I already gave uh, Kelsey a, a mm -hmm. set of the, the PDF uh, that's there. You, could, you can post a link uh, with, the, with the talk as well if you want. Perfect. Um, and, you know, come on, EPA, what about bugs? We've just learned that <laughs> they are just as important. Um, yes, we, will, we can send around the PDF of slides. So thank you, Claudio, for that. And um, 
like we said, we're, we've recorded this and we will give us a minute to, to splice the video together and then we will post it to our YouTube. Um, I don't think we've ever done a webinar on bugs. So this has been super fun, Claudio. Thank you. Oh. This is really great. And, and you know, like, again, like don't forget the little guys. Um, so, so important. I've learned a ton. I hope you all have learned a ton as well. Um, this has just been honestly so fun. I was fascinated the whole time. Um, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. No, thank you for coming and sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, my co-host Danny and Jane. Um, always a pleasure. And thank you all for attending today, taking times out of your day to um, sit and watch this and ask questions. We really appreciate it. Um, there's going to be that survey that I mentioned. You know, take a minute to fill that out. That really helps us. And we will be hosting more of these webinars in the future. So do stay tuned to our social media and our websites and all that stuff. Um, and for any future webinar stuff that, we can, that we're gonna do. And if you have any ideas, you can reach out directly um, to us as well. So thank you again, Claudio. Thank you everyone for joining. And with that, um, everybody have a great rest of your day.